ever-increasing population. So have we become too reliant on wheat, maize and rice? Now on BBC World News, Earth Report investigates. Last century, some 75% of crop varieties have been lost, according to the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization. They say that we now rely on just three crops, wheat, rice and maize, for 60% of our calories. And poorer countries are almost twice as dependent on these cereals as richer nations. But are we relying on too few crops? In southern India, scientists are on their way to the Kali Hills. An ancient culture is changing, and these scientists believe that some old traditions point the way ahead out of what they see as a future global food crisis. So this is the Kali Hills from here? Yeah, this is the Kali Hill. We are at the, we are at the base of the hill. Now we will be climbing very soon. And you can see up there where the the, the, the clouds the cloud, are touching yeah. the hillocks. Uh -huh. That is the Koli Hill. Oh, wonderful. The Koli Hills are mountains of the eastern Ghat range in Tamil Nadu. Nearly 40,000 people eke out a living high above the plains. You can see some white lines there, up there. Yeah, yeah. That is a road, when we a winding road. Okay. With the 74 hairpin curves. Mm. Wow. We'll be reaching 2100 plus okay. feet yeah. above. Okay. Until the 1960s, when the road was built, they were all but cut off from the land below. The scientists are going to see the farming families who have been tilling the land for centuries. They are beginning to have some success in a project to reintroduce a once popular grain, millet. But it's not easy. Millet has been neglected by science and is of little commercial value. Many farmers have switched to cash crops, using the money to buy cheap rice. Although globally now a minor crop, millet is both highly nutritious and very tough. Millet could help provide secure food for the future around the world, especially with the threat of climate change. First of all, I think the environments are going to become more uh, unpredictable, so we need crops that are going to be safe, therefore food security rather than food production and yield. And then I think we're going to have environments in which those crops that are grown locally, we're going to provide food for more than just that local population. They're going to have to feed a wider range of, of people. And we can't rely on importing and moving crops around the world indefinitely. I think we have to be more reliant on locally sourced foods. Millet was once the main source of nutrition for farmers and their families in the Collie Hills. Their forefathers grew much of the area under these crops. This was the only food crop they can depend on. That time there was no communication system, there was no public distribution system. So this was the only dependable crop for them which can be grown in their hill. But the experts worry that traditional knowledge of how to grow it is in danger of dying out. If we see the farmer who is uh, is more than 50 or 60, he is certainly still, you know, uh, recalling in his memory about the traditional farming system. Whereas when we interact with the younger girls or boys or younger youth, you know, they really doesn't know about the farming system of millets. I would say it's it's a kind of cultural erosion. 
Just four kilometers from the millet project, scientist Dr. Balakrishnan from the Swaminathan Foundation is meeting farmers who grow only cassava, also known as tapioca. Like millet, it too was once neglected in different parts of the world. But now, here in the hills, it's the cash crop they sell to the factories in the plains below. He finds it quite profitable. This crop is making a good living for him. Only 20 years back they used to grow millets, he says. They've forgotten growing millets since 20 years. Nobody in his village, he says, uh, is uh, willing to go to other crop. Everybody here uh, is uh, continuing with tapioca growing. Crops like millet were the victim of a hugely successful drive to end hunger in countries like India. Forty years ago, the Green Revolution saw money and resources poured into a few crops like wheat and rice to increase output. Now we have to develop these farmers' rights resource centers. This is also equally important. Once you develop this kind of four banks, the gene bank... Professor M.S. Swaminathan was at the center of that revolution. But even then, he could see the danger ahead in relying on very few crops. He wants farmers to grow a wide range of crops. So I cautioned our farmers and single varieties, genetic homogeneity, these were the words I used, will increase genetic vulnerability to pests and diseases. Therefore, you must have varietal diversity, you must conserve agrobiodiversity. These are all in print, <laughs> 1968 January. Despite these warnings, the last 40 years have seen the major crops throughout the world mopping up almost all research and development spending. If I'm a government and I say, I'm going to spend a million dollars of research on rice, I know I'm going to get some return on it because it's a major crop. So even if I improve the yield by 0.1%, it's going to have a global significance. If I take a marginal crop, which somebody tells me is going to be important in the future, but I've got no evidence for that, and I spend a million pounds, I don't know if it's going to produce, even if it produced 10 times the yield, what's the global significance of that? Unless we've got a market for it, unless there's a promotion for it, that one million pounds is going to be much more difficult to defend. All this uh, uh, part is uh, our orchard. The problem of forgotten crops is not confined to India. Italy, a country famed for its cooking, is losing agricultural heritage. Isabella Dalla Ragioni has spent the last quarter of a century looking for lost varieties of fruit in Umbria. For her, it's a never-ending quest. We know that this was very important for the Romans. The Romans used a lot of this meddler. The Romans used meddler to aid digestion. It is just one of the 400 trees bearing forgotten fruits that Isabella has rescued and planted in her orchard. It's not only a nostalgic view, because some of these varieties are very good, very, very good to sell, and very good smell, good flavor, and uh, so why to lose? Why to throw away? So they are in our, uh, our uh, past, but also they can uh, be also our future. Diamo. Diamo. But the question is, how do crops like millets and medlars fight their way back like cassava and get enough investment to be improved, cultivated, sold and eaten once again? Yep, 
Back in the Collie Hills, many farmers had given up their traditional but reliable millet for the short-term benefits of the cash crop cassava. But cassava has its problems. Cassava needs a certain amount of rainfall distribution for developing tuber and tuber uh, uh, enrichment. So it will be unfavorable to cassava. It will be favorable shift to millets. So the millets are suited to a very adverse situations, both in terms of soil fertility as well as the water availability. And on the ground, progress has been made, with 30 of the 250 villages in the hills growing millet again. Oliver King has been there for 10 years and has helped it happen. What's more, millet's advantage over rice is its higher nutritional value. 